and a very good morning to everyone. I'm so excited to share our journey with you, even though I may not really sound like it because it's actually 3 a.m. in the morning here in Singapore and the walls are quite thin. So this is the outline of my presentation today. It is actually a story of our journey to scan 600 apps with OWASP dependency check in 60 days. Uh, the drivers that actually motivated us to do so, how we went about planning it, with success in mind, how we operationalized and executed the plan and the challenges we faced while they did. So I picked the title with the hope of attracting attendees who can actually relate very strongly with the difficulty and the challenge with an undertaking of such scale. So if you happen to be an information security manager or is in charge of AppSec, which I see based on the poll, uh, we have quite a lot of AppSec uh, leads here with us today. Uh, this is made for you. This talk is addressed to you because uh, more often than not, you would feel that your hands are tied given your circumstances. Uh, even if you are not an AppSec lead, uh, fret not because I find the knowledge and perspectives for running AppSec programs very useful for any AppSec role as we are all part of a larger mission. Uh, and it helps to see beyond our own confines, even if your primary responsibility is to write code with very few things beyond that. That's where I started off myself, developing and architecting hardware, software, and cloud systems before actually moving on to building AppSec programs now and using my knowledge and experience to enable many other roles to contribute towards our shared vision, which, is to, which has brought all of us here together today in the first place. So now that I've set the stage for the session. Let's dive right into the drivers. So how did we find ourselves embarking on this journey? So GovTech is large and the public service that it actually enables is huge. And organizations of size tend to be less agile to changes than other organizations. And this is actually worsened when bureaucracy actually gets into the mix uh, in the public sector. So to set the context of just how challenged GovTech's application landscape is, I've borrowed this article by our local press in mid-September, which actually explained the challenges facing the management of government IT systems. So specifically highlighted in red here, there are more than 2,000 government IT systems built over the years by different vendors using very different technologies, and human errors and process gaps uh, are bound to occur from time to time. And AppSec practitioners like yourself actually integrate with one or more phases of the software development lifecycle. So you could actually say influence or make decisions on how software is actually built, uh, its design, the security controls that are in use, the kinds of tests that are being done on the application, right down to the actual uh, implementation of it itself, like writing the code that actually makes up the product. And at GovTech, we need to achieve the same objectives, but through dozens of different vendors who actually built the IT systems for us. So working through vendors in an outsourced application development environment is particularly challenging. The first challenge stems out from the lack of control on the development environment, uh, what we call the vendor backyard. So our vendors actually provide their own development resources outside of the government controlled environment, uh, which may not be sufficiently secured and is very costly to audit. And monolithic systems that were developed more than a decade ago are still actually very much uh, used and in operation with very little deployment automation, application security testing practices, uh, with built and change control still being performed very manually due to the air gap hosting environment in which many of these applications are deployed. And the second challenge is with the varied use of tools and development testing practices. It is actually difficult to ensure consistent quality across different systems when tooling and practices are not consistently applied or enforced. There is little to no visibility into whether testing is performed properly or effectively. So uh, to give you an example, a vendor one of our vendors actually had three copies of the same library in the application, and only one was actually being patched for. The other two were left uh, to be vulnerable. And the vendor's understanding of the capabilities of the various tools and techniques uh, may be very poor based on our experience without necessarily understanding how the practices that they are asked to perform contribute towards the AppSec objectives. 
and many activities are actually nothing more than just check block exercises that are ineffective. So majority of our application security issues observed in GovTech root themselves very strongly from the first two challenges on this slide. So when we discuss and agree to shift left on security as an organization, we seek to incorporate security testing and practices into the early phases of the development process, uh, such as track modeling on the application architecture before code is ever even written, uh, is an example. And having a good confidence that the developers actually writing the code are aware of uh, secure software uh, practices when code is re being written. So these practices and controls are particularly challenging to implement in an outsourced application development context, especially when the system owners or the business may choose to prioritize features and cost over security. So GovTech's intervention to this vendor backyard problem is the SG tech stack or the Singapore tech stack, which is actually a suite of commercial tools hosted in the government environment whose configurations are actually compliant or immediately compliant with the government standards. And projects can actually subscribe to the SG tech stack offerings, which includes a standardized CI/CD tool chain, uh, dot ship that actually provides code repos, the, uh, static analysis uh, tools, SCA tools, uh, dynamic analysis tools, and a cloud hosting environment as well. Uh, dot ship, uh, sorry, dot GCC actually, with offerings from the major cloud service providers such as AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And this may seem like a silver bullet to the vendor backyard problem. So simply have all 2000 or IT systems move onto the SG tech stack, right? And our vendor backup problem actually goes away. But unfortunately, that's not the case. The SG tech stack solves in the very best case, only half of the problem as the total addressable market is actually a fraction of the applications that we have. Only new applications or applications that are actually earmarked for what we call cloud modernization. Uh, with non-sensitive data classifications are permitted to consume the SG tech stack and have access to these tools within a government hosting environment. And many of the legacy and sensitive applications are actually left in the cold, uh, ever more exposed to brewing threats, which is uh, not surprising because a report on dark reading in June actually claimed that close to four-fifths of third-party libraries in applications are never updated. And patching of third-party libraries may have been a proactive activity in the past uh, in the interest of compatibility or not breaking things or uh, applications that really work. But those days are well over and the risks of not doing so is far greater than before. And threat actors are actively exploiting the critical known vulnerabilities from years ago at scale now, such as the Telerik UI and the Apache Struts. Uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities from back in 2017. And many organizations have yet to patch for these vulnerabilities despite the four year runway. And this does not even include the new attack vectors and vulnerabilities that are continually being discovered. The risks from patch that can no longer be not given today's climate. And GraphTech um, has a few pre-existing tools that actually tries to centralize some of this infrastructure and host vulnerability management across the whole of the government. So these tools were actually a response to audit findings from a few years ago that actually showed a poor compliance of the patch management at these layers. And detection of known vulnerabilities for infrastructure and host layers are fairly straightforward because as we know, tools are very well established Published and the patch regime is also a very well explored topic and is supported across, like, say, for example, various operating systems, such as with uh, Windows, there's WSUS, with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, there's uh, Red Hat Satellite, for example. Uh, unfortunately, the same cannot be said of third party libraries in applications, which actually require most of the time uh, source code to be available and the developer to actually make changes to the application for the upgrade and have the application thoroughly tested after patching. Our vendor backyard situation resulted in source code of applications not being stored centrally in the government environment. Therefore, SEA has to be performed and actioned upon 
by the vendors within their development environment in order to close the gap. So you might wonder why we did not consider having the vendors check in at minimum their source code into a government controlled repository. That was considered and deliberated, but turns out it was a blocker to our need to actually move quickly to identify vulnerable libraries as the process of designing and provisioning the infrastructure to support code repositories for sensitive applications is actually a very complicated affair. And it's not a really a real blocker to weeding out vulnerable libraries that are unpatched. And what we need is an intervention in the form of a centralized solution that fills the gap, uh, that addresses the problem directly and completely across a large number of applications. So it is very tempting to actually go for the best in class uh, provider when implementing any particular solution. Uh, that is the most obvious thing to do, assuming that budget is not a concern. And typically for government uh, sector, that is not a concern. But there are nuances across different tools. Some may actually perform better across different concerns, but underperform in areas that your organization actually cares about the most. And I doubt that as not all concerns are equal. And in our case, the risks from the unpatched third-party libraries with known vulnerabilities actually far outweigh all other supply chain concerns that SEA tools can potentially address. This may not be the same for your organization. Say, perhaps you have a process that already ensures that packages with known vulnerabilities are not being introduced into your build and delivery pipeline, but your delivery, uh, but, you, but you deliver software uh, as products and have no means to actually identify, say, the open source license risks that might actually invite legal trouble later on. Or you are in a high assurance environment where the introduction of malicious packages is a much bigger concern. And your ideal SDA solution is one that actually has a package firewall to mitigate the supply chain risks of obtaining the wrong packages. So before adopting any solution, uh, properly evaluate your concerns and have that inform the closest matching solution that addresses your concerns. So it may turn out to be more effective than a costly solution that provides many capabilities but under delivers for what you really care about. And I think from experience, the marketplace guides are a very good reference for who is in the game uh, for a particular piece of uh, technology and a good starting point for your own internal evaluation of what the op commercial options are. Though what really works for others may not work as well for you, which you will see from our experience later. So based on the studies uh, that we have conducted on the past centralized vulnerability management programs that uh, we run within GovTech, we have identified a, true, a few critical success factors that should be duly considered. So this is particularly relevant to programs that kind of sits outside the software delivery pipeline that may not benefit from the integration points for automation or expert resource, such as with uh, our case for SCA here. So the first is to adopt tools that actually provide a high signal to noise ratio. So this means that false positive rate of results should be low and unskilled developers may not be conversant enough to actually triage the results from these tools directly. Uh, testing methods such as uh, static analysis actually yield very large number of false positives in an effort to reduce the false negatives, which can actually lead to the results being ignored or challenged, which puts any program in jeopardy. And next, adopt tools that are actually architecture agnostic and have what we call high consistency. So this means that the tool should actually be relevant and applicable across different application designs and environments and minimizes the exceptions by which the user has to grapple with a different tool for say in a C sharp versus a Java environment, a Windows versus a Linux environment, uh, an AWS or Azure or cloud uh, environment versus on-premise. It is actually tempting to address the lowest hanging fruit in your universe while totally ignoring the elephant in the room that really matters. And finally, adopt tools that actually provide simple and actionable results. So this translates to minimal reliance on 
the central team that offers the tool to, uh, to enable the development teams. The project teams tend to expect the central team to serve as the triage team for the unskilled developers uh, back in point one, because the scan is imposed on them by the central team. And the project teams who primarily serve as a vendor management role may not have the expertise to actually discern the results. And this actually adds considerable overhead, which you do not want to incur as a central team because it puts your team at risk of uh, burning out. So you may have noticed how these considerations actually aligns with uh, maximizing security impact while minimizing the resource usage. And based on our studies of the many programs and initiatives in our organization before us, the ability to achieve these outcomes actually contributes significantly towards the success of the program. So now that I've established our need to implement a centralized SCA solution and are convinced that it is the right solution to address our problem, uh, we advance into the planning and the execution phases. So, AppSec is a fairly technical discipline, and uh, when operating in AppSec, we spend most of our time working on solutions that actually involve technology directly. And from my experience, many brilliant engineers actually built very elegant technological solutions that failed, not because the technology itself is flawed, but because the technology was actually built in a vacuum where only the technology mattered in solving the problem and reality is much more than technology that actually works well for its intended function. So very often overlooked uh, from experience are the people and process facets of the problem. So I find this uh, PPT framework, which is actually first conceived for operational efficiency back in the 1960s, still very relevant for technology management today. And this framework has guided me to challenge a lot of norms and uh, develop innovative solutions that actually achieved the intended objectives effectively, as with SCA here. So the model is simple to use. So just consider the interactions where two facets actually meet. So uh, for example, between the people and the process facets, do people really understand how they fit into the process? So in the context of operationalizing SCA and GovTech, existing processes for quality, acceptance and change management already exist. So do the staff who actually are very seasoned with the existing process. So these are the invariants uh, or invariant components as we call it. Well, we're not seeking to override the existing process or hire new people just to do SCA. And having do people do more is actually uh, largely unpopular. So a program that fail to explore such tensions will not be balanced and is highly likely to actually crumble eventually. So I like to use the analogy of a three-legged stool where one leg is actually shorter than the other. So if you sat on it, you would fall, uh, no surprise there. And the analogy is actually very apt. So imagine when all three legs are also too short, the stool is rather useless. Uh, it's as good as sitting on the ground directly. And to address this tension, it is paramount to show people why they need to do what they're asked of and that their pains of doing more than they have been uh, asked of is duly considered with all practical uh, automation opportunities explored, uh, that the ask of them actually helps them do their job better, that their success is intricately related to the adherence of the process. So, Exploring the tensions is a good start, but it's not sufficient in itself. So each facet should also be considered thoroughly in itself. The more information we can gather, the more knowledge we have, the more wisdom we have to make good informed judgments as we execute and evolve the program. And extending the analogy of the stool, this is the distance between each leg of the stool. How comfortably we seat our bumps on the stool is defined by whether it's a perfect triangle or just simply a narrow wedge, uh, not particularly pleasant to rest on. And from experience, technology is hardly ever a problem. Uh, the ability to mobilize people to follow through a process is key to a successful program. So we'll show in the second half of this session, 
how the process facet actually played a critical role in the success of our SCA program. So pay a particular attention to how attuned we were of the key steps that it took uh, to achieve our objective. Many consume process by which they are given without much thought. So perhaps it's because it's provided out of the box by the product they procure uh, and is convinced that it is actually industry norm and that the expert who actually built the product knows better. So I think an extreme example is uh, the ERP or enterprise resource planning software space, uh, which do not generalize to all forms of business, but it's still very prevalent and widespread, at least in, in my region it is. And that uh, it has actually resulted in a lot of pain for the users and the businesses who had to adapt to the technology in highly frustrating ways. So uh, in my opinion, technology is amazing and an enabler of great things, but uh, we can find ourselves putting on a straight jacket uh, if we are not careful about how it fits for us. So a lot can go wrong when mobilizing hundreds of people let alone if they are spread across different vendors, in our case, and also parts of the organization. Uh, miscommunication, turning a blind eye to the ask uh, can happen very often, especially in a highly technical domain, such as AppSec. So some understanding of what actually makes people tick and being aware of our own blind spots is very helpful to framing any program, especially when mobilizing large numbers of people with very experiences and expertise on the subject. So it is easy and tempting to say, use authority and power to push through our agenda, uh, but that's not very collaborative and only invites a lot of resentment. And successful programs are not defined uh, solely or merely by whether people actually follow instructions to a T. A program is successful uh, really when people understand and resonate with the intent uh, and can make an informed decision, which actually stays true to the intent when any unexpected exceptions were to surface. So I find these two concepts uh, pretty encompassing when uh, communicating with people. So the first is the curse of knowledge. So we are effectively not our user you know, and embodies this concept very well. And the stereotype is that technical people kind of live in our own worlds and have very little empathy for the user. And that we tend to make assumptions of how easy it is to perform a task if we were to do it ourselves. Uh, what we may not realize is that our audience do not have the same depth of experience or expertise to actually see through the very same task. So put yourself in the shoes of the user, uh, have conversations with them, empathize with your challenges. Doing so actually minimizes the number of assumptions made and helps us avoid very unnecessary abstractions that may not be as prevalent as we think. So on this note, I have a related story to share. So SCA may be the universally accepted term for software composition analysis in our space. And for brevity, we make reference to it as SCA in our own presentations. Of course, after having set the context and defined it in full. So after one of our presentations, a uh, project manager actually wrote to me, uh, sending me a, a static analysis report and asked if it qualified as a SCA scan. And turns out that in her world, uh, SCA refers to fortify source code analysis because source code analysis is also SCA. And turns out that she wasn't alone because uh, Fortify was a fairly uh, popular product within our organization. Others were also very similarly confused, but didn't actually write to me to clarify. And uh, unfortunately, the story doesn't end that here. Our organization also had a separate process that agencies have to perform and undergo annually to declare these to the central authority all IT systems and assets that they actually have. And the process is actually called the System Criticality Assessment, also acronymed as SCA. So the confusion didn't just end there. So the curse of knowledge is actually not as easy to break out of it as uh, it seems. So even when preparing this deck, uh, I struggled with it. Um, it may not be natural or second nature to us, but some awareness and an effort to actually break out of it is better than none.
So the second concept is to actually appeal to one's self-interest. So I explored this in depth on the previous slide when considering the tensions between people and process. Uh, some methods we used include case in point stories of known vulnerabilities that were exploited and to make it as close to home as possible. So the stories were based on actual security incidents that happened to the unfortunate counterparts from other agencies and the ensuing pain that they had to go through after that and how our program is an investment that actually pays dividends for them down the road. And the ability to invoke such feelings or emotions is a very powerful tool that makes ideas really stick. So I took some time to share in depth the methodologies we used for planning our program. It is time to show you how all of that was put into practice in the selection of the SEA tool and in the design of the process. So we evaluated two free and open source offerings and three commercial options. For the open source options, we evaluated the OWASP dependency check and OWASP dependency track. So both are great tools, but are fairly opinionated uh, in themselves on how SEA is to be performed. So I won't go into the details in this talk. You can actually uh, revisit Steve Springett's uh, session from yesterday, I believe, and or actually find his excellent resources online that actually compares the uh, software build material SBOM method with the conventional SCA that uh, was dependency checked users. So back to the topic itself, uh, the commercial options that were shortlisted uh, from Forrester Wave based on the uh, preliminary filter for solutions that actually support on-premise deployment because the policy in which we operate by does not actually allow us to consume software as a service-based security solutions. The success factors for the evaluation were performed or uh, informed by our organizational and business needs. And they seek to actually maximize the security impact and minimize resource usage as shared in the earlier slide on the considerations for centralized vulnerability management solutions. So I will not go through all of these uh, success factors, though it is worth drawing your attention specifically to logistics as it influenced our architectural decisions and ultimately our choice of the SDA tool later. So I hinted of this when I looking at people, process and technology methodology earlier. Uh, when I suggested how the process facet actually played a very critical role in the success of our program. And logistics is important as we need the ability for the vendor to actually perform the scan without connecting to the central server. The vendor backyard do not have access to the secure government environment where SCA server uh, is to be hosted if there is one. And we also have a preference for the reports to actually be self-contained with sufficient detail for remedial action by the vendor in a highly portable format uh, for sharing between the vendor and the agency. And uh, that makes actually a web portal access uh, highly attractive, but it is unlikely to actually provide um, the, uh, the access that is uh, needed for our vendors because of the secure government environment. And, Provisioning the access actually adds a lot of overhead uh, to our process significantly. And we actually performed the evaluation on all the five options, which is summarized into this uh, matrix here. And one of the commercial options checked all the boxes uh, for our defined success factors. And we proceeded to actually design an op operational architecture for it, which is here. And our initial design based on this commercial option actually require the vendor to actually generate uh, SBOM for submission to the SES server, which is to be hosted in the government hosting environment. And the process of uploading the SBOM and downloading the human readable report from the SES server actually requires the two environments uh, to be bridged manually by the various project teams who are literally uh, hand off the SBOM and reports uh, over email, uh, very likely. And it is apparent that doing so actually gives rise to very significant manpower overhead and 
round trip delay, the vendor will have to wait for the project team to upload the S bomb to the SCA server, have it processed by the SCA server before downloading and returning the human readable reports to the vendor for remediation. And it would be a lot more ideal if the scan performed by the vendor actually yield actionable results uh, immediately. The only option which provides such capability was really OWASP dependency check. And assuming we were to use OWASP dependency check, the vendor will have immediate access to the actionable results in the form of a HTML uh, report that's generated by the tool directly. However, OWASP dependency check do not provide a central server for that enables the aggregation of uh, the scan results across different projects or for tracking the vulnerability trends for each project. And in our case, uh, it is determined that central oversight is important because when exploring the process facet, it is determined that uh, if we can't measure it, we can't improve it. Because based on our past experiences, we know uh, as a matter of fact, that we can't simply leave the vendor and the project teams to see through remediations uh, because it will not be done and that we need a handle of the problem across the board. So the ideal solution would actually allow us to capture the results from OWASP dependency check uh, centrally. And that is what we did. We devised a process tool provide the vendor with simple and concrete uh, instructions on how to actually obtain OWASP dependency check and how to actually perform a scan and obtain the results. After which the vendor would hand off the report to the respective project teams um, who would then submit the report via a structured form to an intranet portal that we published on an existing SharePoint system. And our team will review and approve the submission and doing so actually allowed us to better understand uh, if there were any unexpected exceptions that occurred during the scans and anything that we were not aware of, of the behavior of what's dependency check or given the vendor environment. And upon our uh, the approval, uh, after our review, the, re the records in SharePoint is updated which can then be monitored in real time via an Excel dashboard that draws data from SharePoint. So this solution solved half the problem. It enables us to collate the results centrally. So we have a handle of which projects actually performed the scans and which ones didn't. However, there's no analytic capabilities on the vulnerabilities. We weren't able to aggregate or train the discovered issues within or across different projects. That would be most ideal. So we didn't leave it as that. We actually iterated our architecture further. So the first few steps are fairly similar to before. The difference is that upon the review uh, and approval of the reports, the OWASP dependency check report is fed into a custom Python automation system that uh, interprets the report and stores the individual vulnerabilities into a data warehouse before updating uh, SharePoint records with the vulnerability counts and emailing the notification uh, to the agency on the submission status. And that storage in the data warehouse actually allows us to query via different analytic tools uh, for insights of the vulnerabilities, uh, including uh, Microsoft Power BI and Anaconda. And the architecture has evolved significantly and is sufficient in achieving our objective of identifying the vulnerable third-party libraries and driving informed and action across multiple agencies uh, through the use of analytics. However, it's not quite the end of the story yet. If possible, we would very much like to consider monitoring for emerging vulnerabilities and to actually notify the vendors or the project teams with multiple components 
uh, with multiple vulnerable components as new vulnerabilities actually emerge. This will actually reduce the exposure to known vulnerabilities further as even if the vendor actually fails to perform uh, routine scans with OWASP dependency check that our system will use the last known uh, build materials from the submitted dependency check report to actually ascertain if any known vulnerabilities exist within the systems. So, and that is what we are working on uh, towards right now, which is the work in progress system. Uh, so instead of storing the individual vulnerabilities that is extracted from OWASP dependency check report into a data warehouse, we store the components in use into OWASP dependency track instead. Uh, and this would allow us to actually uh, continually retrieve from the vulnerability feeds uh, from NVD and various sources daily uh, by OWASP dependency track to identify new emerging vulnerabilities from the use of existing components. And this also unlocks the uh, web portal analytics that is built into OWASP dependency track for uh, data analytics and insights. So revisiting our initial evaluation metrics, we have augmented the capabilities of both OWASP dependency check and OWASP dependency track to actually achieve our intended objectives. And our solution may appear a little unorthodox to some, but it worked extremely well in driving the remedial action across 600 applications that would otherwise not have happened within 60 days. And our journey was not free from unexpected challenges. And I'll spend the rest of the time to show you some of them. Uh, most of them actually pertain to the aftermath of the scan, such as with the interpretation of the OWASP dependency check reports, some of which we did not expect given that there is a lot of variance in 600 applications that were scanned across very different environments. So the scans of quite a few uh, ASP.NET projects actually yielded very consistent false positives uh, through this set of dependencies. And this didn't challenge vendors who were more astute and able to interpret the findings as, the, as false positives uh, fairly confidently. Though we still received a number of support queries from our agencies. And when our team actually investigated the OWASP dependency check reports, we saw two vulnerabilities rep uh, repeatedly flagged for these components. So notice how generalized the CPEs for, uh, for these vulnerabilities are. And for those who are unfamiliar with the CPE convention, it is actually an official structuring scheme uh, by NIST that identifies uh, software packages and their corresponding versions, uh, also known as the uh, common platform enumeration. And CVEs, as we more commonly know, are tagged to CPEs, which actually enable the, a machine accessible way to determine if a particular piece of software or package have known vulnerabilities. And uh, based on this, uh, in my opinion, OWASP dependency check actually did what it's supposed to be doing because uh, by design, it trusted the CVEs from NVD's vulnerability feed, which turned out to be too generalized. And although SCA, as I mentioned earlier, have very high signal to noise ratio, false positives for misidentification still do occur, especially for evidence-based identification methods uh, used in uh, OWASP dependency check, though in much smaller numbers. And this is also where the SBOM method uh, shines through as it's less prone to misidentification that does not stem from the NVD as with this case. So I strongly encourage you to take a look at Steve, uh, Steve's talk from uh, yesterday on Cyclone DX. Cyclone DX is a SBOM format which was promoted uh, to become a OWAP flagship project of OWAPS in June this year. So 
since OAuth dependency uh, check scans are decentralized, we have effectively uh, very limited means to suppress such issues on behalf of our vendors and the project teams centrally. In fact, uh, the common suppressions uh, for OAuth dependency check are baked directly into the tool itself and actually require uh, the lead developer, uh, Jeremy Long, uh, of OAuth dependency check to actually compile and publish a new version of the tool to actually reflect any new suppressions from component misidentification. Suppressions by the user during the time of scan is actually provided to OAuth dependency check in a similar XML format, which is actually sufficiently convenient for most cases as the report actually uh, provides a helpful button here. As you can see the suppress button, which if they click would generate a little XML snippet, which can then be incorporated into a suppression file that can be checked in uh, to the code repository of the project alongside with the source code. And it is ideal if the suppressions were uh, built in a more accessible manner to a lay person, such as our project teams, Though we are also very mindful that the OAuth dependency check is designed as a standalone tool and there are actually practical and logistical constraints to consider. So for our case, we rely on the vendor developers to actually perform the suppressions. And the only related complaint that we have really come across was when a large number of issues actually have to be suppressed. And the means by which the suppression file is put together doesn't actually scale very well for a large number of suppressions. And suppressions are typically uh, one sort of activity uh, and projects with very large numbers of suppressions are few and far between. So this problem is really not as uh, significant as it seems. So another project team also reached out to us uh, very recently on a case where Lodash was actually flagged as uh, vulnerable by dependency check and that no patch was actually available for this particular vulnerability. And this was quite interesting. So we actually investigated the case a lot more in depth and found that the CVE was actually incorrectly issued for the behavior of the library which turns out to actually be expected. The reporter did not perform a responsible disclosure on the issue uh, with the developers for Lodash uh, before actually requesting for a CVE assignment. And this actually resulted in a lot of SCA tools flagging the component uh, as vulnerable when it's actually not. And the issue was actually being discussed very extensively on Lodash's uh, GitHub uh, itself, but the damage is actually uh, already done because the Rainius vulnerability has to be suppressed manually for users of SDA tools uh, all over the world that feed directly from the MVD vulnerability feeds. And at least until the CVE assignment is revoked. So you can see the summary has been updated, but the CVE still lives within the vulnerability feeds. And interestingly, we uh, also took some time out to actually review the commercial SDA solutions, whether they would have been able to address this on behalf of the user. And turns out that only one uh, of them made any attempt to actually suppress this vulnerability for its users. So it would have been no, uh, not very much different if we were on a commercial solution that fed uh, from a vulnerability feed that is managed by uh, the uh, product principle. So, and um, although we did not advise our project teams to scan uh, base products or commercial products uh, or cost products, as we can call it, uh, some of them did nonetheless. Uh, our advice to not actually scan these types of products was stamped out from the limited influence uh, over the components in use within the base products and that the base products itself uh, should have patched for. And uh, as long as you apply the patches of the base products, it's sufficient. Uh, nonetheless, for prudence sake, if any vulnerable components were discovered in any base product, our advice is for our uh, project teams to actually take the issue up with the product principal who from our experience so far, either provide an attestation of non-exploitability uh, given how the components are being used 
uh, within their products or some form of configuration that would actually mitigate the exploitation of uh, the vulnerabilities. And this uh, slide, it is actually quite unfortunate that some vendors choose to challenge the discovered vulnerabilities by uh, dependency check. And uh, they take on a very hard stance that uh, GovTech actually has to prove to them that the vulnerability is exploitable before they actually perform any remedial action. And in such cases, we default to our policies uh, position on patching of known vulnerabilities, uh, which should have informed the tender and the corresponding contract clauses, which the vendor is to abide by. And to also advise our project teams to step up on the third party management and governance processes. Uh, our project teams have to learn to see beyond just the visible requirements uh, of the system and into the invisible requirements when managing the delivery of their vendors. System owners can choose to set the risks posed by the vulnerabilities or what we call right classify the risks based on the mitigation controls that are in place. And the most common uh, that we see would be to actually literally write off risks for systems that are actually uh, hosted on the intranet and not internet accessible, which is actually a form of security through obscurity and violates the spirit of uh, defense in depth, which we strongly advise against uh, doing so. But however, the risk tolerance varies across different parts of the organization. And depending on the customer that is being served, uh, how risks are being treated is actually a function of how much risk the customer is willing to take. And in our opinion, uh, it is almost always le uh, less effort to actually patch for known vulnerability than to prove uh, non-exploitability. I, I believe this holds true for most, uh, almost all cases, even for projects of uh, significant size. And clearing a backlog of um, unpatched debt is actually a very painful once-off process, but reaps very significant benefits down the road uh, in an ever-changing and ever-evolving threat landscape. So just doing a bit of a time check, I think I have two minutes left. Uh, I have some time to squeeze in some reflections uh, of our experience before closing off. So since the uh, start of the program, we have actually noticed very visible change in some parts of our agencies and vendors attitudes towards uh, patching of components with known vulnerabilities. Uh, even if we are uh, not able to directly observe or measure their actions. So perhaps the awareness of such issues were just lacking prior to the, this program. And what some of them really needed was a contextualized guide for a specific to our environment to get things started. And one of our juggernaut vendors actually made a commitment uh, to make significant changes to their software delivery process uh, across the board for uh, a large number of uh, applications that they actually maintain and develop uh, to uplift the secure coding and application security testing practices. Uh, after we showed uh, through this exercise, the gaps of their existing practices, uh, which happen to be left to the individual delivery teams to see through. So uh, also from this exercise, we have actually measured uh, the exposure to known and severe vulnerabilities and have a marked reduction of um, upwards of 70% of uh, critical and high uh, severity vulnerabilities being re removed from our environment uh, through known vulnerabilities. And uh, this is only going to improve further as we in, uh, discover uh, as we actually give the agencies and the vendors more time to actually perform their remediations and um, perform this new practice of uh, discovering uh, known vulnerabilities uh, within the R systems. And if there is something we need to actually do uh, better as an organization, it is really to incorporate the security outcomes into the deliverables in an effective and measurable manner and many of our vendors and project teams are still very much driven by 
uh, what we call process activities and uh, functional delivery. Uh, and it's not yet able to say grasp the true intent of app site activities as they are asked of. And the app site landscape is ever evolving and the interventions are needed to actually improve app site practices significantly. Uh, should we actually uh, continue to depend on uh, vendor sourced uh, delivery of uh, secure software uh, actually uh, supports an ever-growing need for uh, within our digital government space. So this brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. And I hope you took away something useful from our own experience. So feel free to connect with me over LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have uh, with the rest of the time or offline. Thank you very much.